welcome back to the MINIAC and today we are going to be doing the definitive guide on the R53 Cooper S. Now if you saw the last one I went over the R50 Cooper as well as the R52 Cooper convertible but today we're going to do the R53 Cooper S as well as the R52 Cooper S convertible. So a little background on the vehicle. U.S. spec Mini Cooper S R53s were produced between 2002 and 2006. The R52 Cooper S convertible was produced between 2005 and 2008. The car was produced at the plant Oxford in Cowley, England. The designer was Frank Stevenson, as we already knew. The car used a supercharged 1.6 liter four-cylinder Tritec motor co-developed with Chrysler. The transmission choices for this vehicle were a six-speed automatic Azen 6F21WA or TF60SN transmission, six-speed automatics, or a Getrag G285 six-speed manual. The gear ratios in that vehicle were changed between 2004 and the end of production for the R53. So 2002 to 2004, they had a different gear ratio than 2004 to 2006 and as well as 2005 to 2008 for the R52 convertible Cooper S. So, some other little things there. As far as horsepower is concerned, it had 163 horsepower between 2002 and 2004. In the 2005 LCI facelift, they bumped the horsepower up to 168 horsepower. The John Cooper Works version of this vehicle had 200 horsepower, and the infamous GP1 had 215 horsepower. As far as issues with this vehicle, same as the Cooper, you had oil leaks, power steering pump issues, engine mount and suspension mount issues, no transmission issues really with this car, which was a good thing. Sunroof had leaking if it did leak, it had that issue depending on car. You also had the same rust issue, so you had the possible rust around the taillights, subframe, gas cap, you know the deal. Same thing with all that stuff, same thing with the Cooper, really. As far as brakes were concerned, same deal as the Cooper. As far as high mileage, now I had tried to go into that with the Cooper and I got cut off by a camera glitch. So for high mileage, we're talking about 150,000 miles or over and they I've been told that the car might need a valve job, cylinder head replacement, and power steering pump line issues. So things that might pop up with these cars when you pass 150,000 miles might come up. Same deal with the other things related to the car, the rear lateral control arms, the strut mounts, all that stuff. Anyway, as far as the GP car is concerned, that car was hand finished by Bertoni in Italy and the cars, there were only 2,000 of those cars built. They had an 88 pound weight reduction compared to the Cooper S. So they took out the back seat, they didn't do xenon headlights, They did a lot of other things. They removed sound deadening. The car had a better exhaust, a better intercooler. It was just more powerful. So it was a better car overall. It was a better car overall, but very limited edition. So very hard to find those cars. And there's a reason that those cars still hold their value. As far as the R52 convertible, look for the same things with the convertible top, the sunroof mode, and the function of the convertible top folding mechanism. So same stuff as the Cooper, but we're gonna get into some sp specific Cooper S stuff here, as well as some things that some people have recommended that you do with a Cooper S if you manage to get your hands on an R53 Cooper S. Now, I don't recommend you have to do all of this, but this is just stuff that someone said they'd recommend doing if you want to make the car even better. That being said, I have a friend with a 2002 Cooper S that has really, really low mileage on it. He's not doing a darn thing to it. He's keeping it stock because it keeps the value as these cars are starting to become more collectible. I have another friend with a very low mileage 2006 Cooper S JCW who's doing the same thing. Very selective modifications and he's keeping the car as low mileage as possible because it improves the value. So these cars are starting to become collectible and low mileage examples are becoming very, very hard to find. So as far as the R53 Cooper S is concerned, I know some of you out there love to change your ignition coils and ignition wires to the MSD ones. You don't need to do that. Leave it stock. The stock ones do the job and they're fine. Check the plugs, check the coils, check the wires. If there's anything worn out on that, replace with OEM parts. Do not go cheap, do not go aftermarket, go OEM because 
the system worked great from the factory and didn't need to be improved upon. And I've owned an R53 before and I highly recommend this. Don't do anything aftermarket with the ignition system. It'll just make things, it might just mess up the car. So just keep it the way it is. Coolant leaks, the cars had some coolant leaks. I'll get into that in just a little bit. As far as the supercharger is concerned, now I know BMW says that the supercharger does not need to be serviced. That is a myth. The supercharger does need to be serviced. Some people say to service it between 60,000 and 100,000 miles, but they do recommend changing the oil in the supercharger. Now, you don't need any special oil with this. In fact, you can go to your local Chevrolet dealership and get the Eaton supercharger oil that is used in the Corvette. Same oil and it will work in the twin scroll supercharger that's in the R53. As far as the cylinder head, cylinder gasket replacement, that stuff, the reason that you might want to check for cracks in your cylinder head, for example, is if the cylinder head cracks, it can cause coolant to leak into the engine, which can cause all sorts of problems. That is one of the reasons why you want to make sure you don't have any damage in the engine bay. You want to find a car that has a good engine and you want to make sure the service records show that the car has been well maintained. Power steering pump and lines, naturally as the car gets older, those things need to be serviced or possibly replaced. So look at those things as well. Now as for the automatic transmission, it did have one issue. It had a valve body on it that you needed to check the service intervals for and possibly replace the valve body if it started to fail on that transmission. Now if it didn't get ch checked regularly or if it failed, it could possibly damage the transmission and you're looking at a very expensive transmission replacement. In fact, I had a friend with one and she couldn't afford to replace the transmission she personally couldn't afford to replace the transmission, but the transmissions can get very, very pricey. So check the service intervals, check maintenance, make sure things have been maintained properly. As far as high mileage is concerned with these cars, R53s, because they are the supercharged car and even the R52 Cooper S convertibles, they tend to be driven harder and they tend to wear harder. They tend to wear out a little bit quicker than the Coopers do because the Coopers weren't driven as spiritedly as the folks who drove the Cooper S's. So you want to make sure that things have been maintained properly and nothing is damaged. And if it is damaged, get it fixed. If it is something that deters you from buying the car, don't buy the car if it's really bad. If it's something that could be fixed fairly cheaply, then buy the car. These are cars that you actually do want to kind of learn how to fix yourself because it can get expensive to take it to the dealership and have it worked on or take it to a mechanic. But I've found that it's fairly easy to do it in your driveway if you know what you're doing. Get an owner's manual, not an owner's manual, get a repair manual. Haynes has one, Shilton's has one, and they provide all the information you really need. Now here are some things that a friend of mine mentioned that he says you should do with an R53. Now I don't necessarily recommend that you do this if you don't want to, if you're not comfortable doing this, but these are things he recommended and I'm going to include these on the list. now. As far as the timing chain tensioner goes on these cars, I had one go out on my car, the car sounded like a tractor. So if the timing chain tensioner fails, replace with OEM, do not go cheap on this part because that is your timing chain, that keeps your car in time. You don't replace it with something cheap, otherwise the car is going to have issues. I also want to remind you all that there was a resistor issue on the cooling fan that would cause the high speed resistor to fail. and. No, actually, I take that back. It would cause the low speed resistor to fail, so the fan would always run in high. Now, you can get an aftermarket fan and pop it in there, and it might fail again. You can get a, resist a new resistor and piggyback and put it in there, and it might fail as well. But it's something that needs to be addressed if it becomes an issue. I also want to mention that there is a blender or mixer for the AC system that's inside the dashboard. If that fails, that is almost a $2,000 to $3,000 repair because they have to take the dash out of the car. So if you're going to be racing this car and you don't care that it has AC, don't worry about it. If you're going to be driving this car daily and you want to have that nice AC, make sure it's working properly. And if it isn't, get it fixed. And if it's going to be really expensive, I suggest you save up your money and make sure that it's working properly. Don't do this work yourself unless you're cap comfortable with taking the dashboard out of your car. As far as the rest of the bushings in the car, if you replace with polyurethane, we call it a one and done kind of thing. You replace the front control arm ones with polyurethane and you're never going to have an issue with 
them wearing out because rubber wears out more easily. It's more flexible, it's more pliable, but urethane, polyurethane doesn't wear out as quickly. I had uh, my R53 fixed camber plates to improve an issue I had with the strut tower strut mounts failing. This friend of mine recommends that you install adjustable camber plates in your vehicle and this is so you can get the alignment proper, especially if you lower the car. So you want to have the alignment proper to make sure the tires wear evenly and all that stuff. It's also recommended to possibly replace the plastic reservoir overflow tanks with aluminum ones. They do offer aluminum ones out there. I've seen them. It's not that difficult to replace the tanks really. I actually replaced one in my R53. That being said, I replaced it with a plastic one because I didn't have the money to buy the more expensive aluminum one. And eventually I ended up selling that car so I never had the point where I needed to get something done again. If you're going to install an aftermarket intake in the vehicle, this friend of mine, and I agree with him, he recommends that you use an enclosed aftermarket intake. Ulta makes one. It's an enclosed air box that attaches to the firewall and the filter goes inside of there and there's a lid on top of that. Do not use an open filter element system because it'll allow all the hot air from the engine to get to that intake and you don't want the hot air going through your intake system, especially given the fact that the filter is located at the back of the engine. So you want an enclosed box system. There are some out there and I'm sure you can find them. There's some from Alta. There's some from, I think there's one from Craven Speed. I think there's even one from M7 Tuning. They're out there. Just take a look. As far as some other issues to be looking out for, and these are some ones that some friends of mine pointed out and I remember these. I don't necessarily remember or hearing about a seat heater issue, but I do remember the seat mat sensor for the airbag sensor in the passenger seat had a recall on it because it would tend to fail, resulting in your airbag light coming on, and even sometimes your car thinking that you have a passenger sitting there without their seatbelt on, so it would turn on the seatbelt chime. Kind of an annoying thing and something you want to look out for. A friend of mine also said that when he lived in Louisiana and had an R53, he had issues with elect he had electrical issues. So he had AC, radio, window motors with malfunction in the car, and these are things that would tend to bother him, and he eventually got them fixed, but Apparently the cars don't really like really high heat and I'm inclined to agree with them on that. I don't like high heat myself though, but I'm not a car, so things to look out for. There's another thing I want to remind you all. My car, when I had it, it went into, let's see, this was in 2013. My R53 on my way home went into limp mode. Now I had it towed to a shop that didn't know anything about Mini Coopers. They thought it was the alternator. $2,000 later and three weeks of waiting, we figured out it wasn't the alternator after they had replaced the alternator, replaced the battery cable, and couldn't figure out the problem. They finally found the problem. It was the harmonic balancer. It is a pulley at the bottom of the engine that is, I think to repair that is about $300 at your local dealership. So $2,000, $300. I would have rather paid the $300 for the harmonic balancer, but they ripped out everything else, they messed up the wiring, and a year later I didn't realize that my marker lights and my fenders weren't working correctly. So things to look out for, take your Mini to a shop that knows what they're doing, take it to the dealership, or work on it yourself if you're comfortable doing that. Don't let a shop work on your car that doesn't know what they're doing, because I I've heard horror stories about shops that didn't know anything about minis and just messed stuff up completely. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this definitive guide to the R53 Cooper S, and this is basically a supplemental offshoot of the Cooper guide as well, so if you didn't get any information out of this video, the rest of that information is in the other video, so watch both of them and you'll get the full information on the vehicle, including the stuff like the strut mounts and the strut tower mushrooming and all that stuff. Those are things to look at and you'll find that stuff also in the previous video as well because I, I mentioned it in that video. But until next time, I want to thank you all for watching. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the little notification bell. I upload videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. Central Time. And if you like this video, leave a like below. Also leave a comment below. If there's something I forgot in these videos, comment below and I will make a sequel to these videos where I will add that information in. I'll put, I'll put up a whole video again where I will just do that information. I'm also thinking of maybe starting a live stream series where I grab one of these cars from a friend of mine and I do a live stream where I have you basically type in and ask me your questions live about these particular cars. So. 
I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that yet. I'm gonna try to figure it out, but trust me, I will. I also plan to have an R56 series coming up. That's gonna take a while to do because the second generation Mini had a lot of cars. We had the R56, we had the R55, we had the R57, the R58, the R59, the R60, the R61. Have I left any cars out? Not to mention we had the N12 engine, the N14 engine, the N16 engine, the N18 engine. We had the GP, we had JCWs, we had a JCW that came its own model. The list goes on. And the N14 had a lot of problems, but we'll get into that with that series and I'm gonna be putting that together so I might be taking a break from this video series thing for a little bit of time so I can get all this information put together. But you'll get to see that video as well. So. Anyway, I just want to remind you all before I let you go that life is too short to drive a boring car, so drive a Mini. I'll catch you all later.